Okay. All right. Uh, so recommendation that council resolve itself in the committee of the whole at five o'clock. I need a mover on this. Councilor uh, Evans, Councilor Malmus, all in favor? Carrie, Colleen, you're online. Malcolm, you're online. All right. Good. I don't happen to see you uh, waving your hand or whatever. Just uh, Get yourself off a of mute and uh, and uh, make me aware that you're uh, wishing to uh, speak. So thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, RCMP quarterly report. Sergeant McNeil, you have the floor, sir, and uh, introduce uh, the other constable with you. Constable. Constable. Board. <laughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Counselor, just call my counselor. Okay. Same thing. <laughs> a staffer. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so I brought with me today uh, my supervisor, uh, Staff Sergeant Sean Begg from uh, Kelowna Stuff East District. And I'm presenting, of course, to Mayor and Council the uh, third quarter report uh, for the fiscal year. Uh, continuing on with our uh, our goals, contributing to road safety, crime prevention uh, through reducing property crimes and contributing to employee wellness and respectful workplace. So looking at our uh, traffic stats uh, for the quarter, which is uh, the October, uh, November, December period, uh, we had 50 uh, traffic stats in October, 74 in November, then down to 49 in December. Uh, for the same quarter uh, the previous year, uh, 20, uh, 2021, we had uh, 48, uh, 29, and 25. That's uh, should be uh, 2020 and the second uh, second boxes in November, December. So five members working resulted in uh, 12 stats per member per month, which exceeded our goal of 10 stats per member. Uh, we had a total number of 173, uh, which was higher than 102 in 2020, uh, when we were, of course, doing uh, less traffic stops due to the uh, new COVID pandemic, which we were circulating through in 2020. Air drivers, uh, uh, immediate roadside prohibitions in October zero, and then each in uh, November and December. And there were four impaired driving charges for the same <coughs> time period in uh, 2020 and only one in 2019. So, fairly uh, consistent there. Collisions, uh, big topic here, as uh, everyone, uh, Mayor and Councilor, are aware uh, for this, uh, this time period. So, we had one fatal. <coughs> in the third quarter it occurred in November. We had the two uh, one-ton trucks which met head-on uh, just at the west entrance to the Braun Bridge. It occurred at about 7.30 at night, so dark, of course. Uh, the driver of one truck was deceased at the scene. The Highway Patrol has assumed uh, the lead on this investigation. Uh, criminal impaired driving uh, charges are underway and uh, being uh, pursued for the Highway Patrol. And you see there uh, for the other collisions uh, for the time period as well. We're down slightly from uh, the previous year. We had 27 uh, compared to 32. 
I also uh, laid out the totals here of the injury collisions that we occurred through the quarter. Nothing too uh, serious uh, with these injury collisions. Uh, the one in October uh, was a young driver. Uh, his vehicle struck the center median. You know, near Silver Sands, he was out with his father and uh, obviously panicked and just hit that median. So it'll be uh, nothing to do with the, the roads or anything. October 9th, we had a pedestrian struck uh, by a vehicle in a parking lot on serious injury. It's the ICBC injury claim. November 21, we had a single vehicle roll for uh, 2K west of Sycamus. Minor injuries to the driver, and the driver self admitted to the officer that they fell asleep, which was, of course, the cause of the injury or the cause of the collision. And then December 24th, we had two vehicles rear end collision on Highway 1 in Malacroix with minor injuries. Comparing that uh, to the third quarter of 2020, we had a total of seven. So, it's keeping on the topic of collisions, even though it's not uh, in the third quarter, the time I'm reporting on to council. Uh, Everyone uh, is probably aware I sent out a press release in the media uh, for the road conditions that we were experiencing uh, the first week of January. So it was quite odd. Uh, we had uh, on the on January uh, 4th, we had eight collisions in the, in the daytime and the evening, eight uh, for one, one day. And that's uh, the time frame uh, when the temperatures were minus 16, minus 20, and the highway had some. Uh, some, some snow on it, but the, with the freezing temperatures, it was just remained icy uh, for our whole district. So I sent out the, uh, the media release, and prior to that, I contacted uh, AIM Highways. So I had an open dialogue, uh, so everyone in the room is aware. I had an open dialogue with uh, Gabriel, the uh, manager at the local AIM uh, building. Told them of uh, my concerns, what the constables were reporting to me, what I had seen out on the highway, so they were aware of it. And I saw their trucks out throughout the day. They were uh, spreading in some sand. And I asked uh, the manager at the time, well, I don't see you guys putting any the icing agent out. And he told me I didn't know this. Uh, we can't do that in temperatures below minus nine Celsius. So for that week, we were nowhere near minus nine Celsius. We were much colder. And there was no other, no de icing agent put out at that time. So the next day, January 5th, we had uh, two more collisions. Uh, luckily, again, there was nothing overly serious with the uh, with the injuries or resulting from that. But uh, the roads were were dangerous. They were uh, very icy, and even even the officers that were driving our patrol cars, which have new snow tires and they're all wheel drive Ford Explorers, uh, they were still saying, "Geez, Murray, we can only go uh, 80, 80, 85 kilometers an hour. If we go above that, we can feel the cars breaking loose on the on the road conditions." So they were, they were generally poor. Uh, then of course, on the 8th, that weekend, we had the uh, major collision, uh, which was recorded extensively uh, throughout the media, made it uh, province wide uh, with the multiple, uh, multiple semi trucks and the fatality uh, with one of the semi drivers involved in that, <coughs> uh, just west of town. And that highway was closed for well over 24 hours. Uh, talking again with highway patrol, uh, they assisted us heavily with that investigation. There's no criminal element to it. Uh, we had no, uh, no one coming forward, no one is saying that uh, the drivers were excessively speeding or anything like that. It was just the, uh, the roads were not in good condition. And I don't want to take a on that. It's just going forward again as a, as a collision um, with, uh, with road uh, conditions being a major factor. And uh, yeah, as I said, it'd be. No, uh, no criminal charges on that. I should say, uh, Mr. Mayor, I, you know, uh, we participated in that meeting with AIM. I uh, was invited to attend that. The MLA, Mr. Kylo was there as well. And, uh, you know, <coughs> council uh, set that letter out. And I, uh, I said, Mike, I observed that week and, and the conditions that I saw. And AIM uh, took the time to explain you know, what they were doing to meet the provincial mandate and what efforts they were doing out on the highways that week. So what happened, happened. And uh, what what we noted, uh, Mayor Council said uh, in their letter, what they put out and what I saw as well. But it, uh, it was definitely icy at the end of the day that the highways were icy and a person had to give uh, a sense of care to avoid uh, having a collision for some of those days out there. Moving on to property crimes, uh, we had no break and enters for the quarter, which is unusual. It's uh, good to see. 
uh, large reduction from uh, the previous year where we had 11 reported. Theft of vehicles, uh, October 8th, we had a Subaru stolen from Main Street and it was recovered a couple of days later on the first side. Uh, uh, key was uh, with the vehicle. October 10th, we had a dirt bike stolen from a condo on Riverside that was in the bed of a truck. <clears throat> November 7th, we had a sled stolen from a property in Malakwa, which was not recovered. November 29th, we had two pickups and an RV trailer stolen from a compound on Mayor Road, and uh, vehicles were recovered. One pickup of the trailer recovered uh, in the Invermere area. And uh, speaking with my colleagues in Invermere, it was suspected that a prolific offender from their area had come into our area and uh, was a perpetrator of those crimes. Uh, no charges were approved on that, but uh, the intel that they received uh, indicated that's what happened. December 6th, we had a stolen SUV recovered in the Owlhead parking lot. Uh, Constable's just doing patrols in the morning to see what was in the parking lot, and the vehicle was stolen in Calgary on November 17th and abandoned there. So that's where it was recovered. <coughs> that shows uh, the stats uh, for the quarter. Top one is uh, kind of the one we wanted to see, or the one that was good to see. Large reduction, uh, zero break in interest for the quarter as compared to 11. Theft of vehicles was constant. Uh, theft from vehicles, about the same. Theft including shoplifting, about the same. And mischief is down a bit. So, overall, in our third quarter, our aiming to reduce uh, property crime data is on track for that. And I'll report in the fourth quarter with the final number quarter, but we should be able to meet our goal of, uh, of overall reducing property crime for the area. Everything else is uh, relatively uh, consistent. Uh, driving complaints is the uh, number one uh, file we get, of course. Uh, we had 75 uh, this quarter. There you see the 27 collisions and one fatal collision. And uh, total calls for service were relatively consistent, 348 compared to 388. Resources, uh, attachment is fully staffed. <coughs> but our our new uh, PSE, which is our secretary, uh, she's transferring in from Relisto, just so we got starting with us in February, and all of our regular member positions are fully staffed, which is good to see. Criminal code uh, charge approvals, we had a uh, charge approval for assault with a weapon, uh, flight from police with a vehicle, and uh, three prohibited driving charges in the court. That's my report. I'll take questions from uh, the room. All right, thanks, Sarge. Uh, uh, Councilor Malmas, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Murray. You do a, a good job. Uh, and particularly, I live not far from the Husky, and I, I enjoy your your guy racing out from across the road there to give those trucks that are blowing through here at 90 kilometers. He's got them pretty much slowed down now. I can actually get out of my driveway and not have to worry about get galloped over because the guy's still down by the mm -hmm. golf course. And so he's got them slowed down considerably. Uh, my other comment is, is that I noticed there was a, before Christmas, there was a couple of homeless people. Uh, are they still around town? I haven't seen them for those. The chap at the uh, Shell Station? Yeah. Yeah. He, he comes and goes. He's still around. <clears throat> We've checked on him a few times and he's a, uh, we call him elderly, but he's he's not a not a young guy, and uh, he's he doesn't have an extensive criminal record or anything like that. No, so, seems like a nice guy. Yeah, yeah. As far as uh, that person in that situation, he's a nice guy. Yeah. That he's the only one that you know of. It. Only one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Bush, go ahead. Mr. Chair, yeah, thanks, Murray. That was a really a good presentation. And uh, on your driving, uh, excuse me, your driving complaints, uh, are, you know, are, are most of them truck truck complaints, truck-related complaints? A lot of them are, yeah. It'll be sending complaints. Yeah. We'll get them from Revelstoke. It'll be called a poll to be on the lookout for, and it's driving westbound from Revelstoke. And people just get uh, frustrated. They get passed by the semi or the semi's tailgating them, and they, they call it in. And, a lot of times it's not a lot of information for us to go on. You can imagine being told to be on the lookout for a white semi heading <laughs> uh, <laughs> covered in road grind. So yeah, that's, that is the majority of them, especially this time of year. 
I just pulled out of the car wash the other day, uh, a couple of days ago, and and uh, I gave you know I had lots of room, and before you know it, the guy was behind me, and uh, he was literally swerving over the yellow line, just you know just dri driving my bumper, and they're really getting control. And I've done a lot of travel back and forth to Edmonton, and uh, I just I've never seen it so bad. And I just wondered all for all your complaints for truckers. And yeah, I'd say more than half of them. Yeah. Would be an estimate. Okay. I've seen CBS commercial vehicles, special force, but I've seen them uh, in the area this week. Uh, they've been uh, around between uh, canoe and the special race, so. Yeah, it'd be nice to be able to slow them down just a little further out, but it doesn't. They don't seem to pick up that speed limit when they, when they, uh, when they get into town. They're still flying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. Councilor McCabe, Councilor Anderson, online. Uh, do you guys want to comment? Uh, sure, I'll, I will. I <clears throat> just like to thank Murray for a great job he's doing in our community and uh, interacting with the high school kids. I see that's sometimes an issue down the coast. I'm not sure why, but in our community, you guys are doing a great job and really, really, really appreciate your efforts here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Walter. Walter Anderson. Yep, thank you. I'm just going to echo what uh, Councillor McCabe just said. Thanks, Murray, for all you do. And uh, yeah, you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen. So, um, yeah, just a comment in regards to uh, the accident uh, with the trucks and uh, the one death and uh, six other people going to the hospital and and um, and the uh, and the conversation we had with Gabe over at AIM and uh, Murray joined us along with Greg and myself and uh, and having Murray's presence there was, I think, was very uh, worthwhile. Um, I did get the impression from AIM in that conversation that um, that uh, they really were concerned about that accident. They were concerned about conditions, and uh, I felt that uh, the conversation was quite uh, quite beneficial. And I I thought that they were actually speaking true to their heart. So uh, that's what I got out of it. Uh, but at the end of it. Um, you know, there was a bit of a message from our group and and uh, between Greg and myself and, you know, um, they're doing the best that they can based on what they've got and the conditions and what they're dealing with when it comes to provincial regulation. But um, uh, the message was that um, they need to really maybe consider picking it up a notch, you know, so and um, I think Murray got that across from as well, but uh, one of the things that is very evident and uh, that is um, they're only capable of doing so much and road conditions can be changed from one day to the next, one week to the next and whatnot. And, and under that particular circumstance, the road conditions were really, really, they were terrible. So, and that's the consequences. So we did write a letter and uh, we wrote a letter to AIM and of course the Trucking Association and I've shared some of my concerns with the mayors along the corridor as well. One question I have in regarding to your list here, Murray, um, uh, the second item, theft of vehicles. Uh, in the case of those thefts, uh, are they locally driven or they transient or how or can well, uh, what's your fair road uh those were from a what we call a prolific offender someone who's uh basically what they do they steal vehicles mm -hmm. and they were coming into the area they had an associate in sycamore and just dealing with uh talking to the members in Invermere, that person was likely in sycamore at that time and then those vehicles were recovered uh in Invermere. so we strongly believe that that was the cause of those uh, the theft of the dirt bike at Riverside, unknown. And uh, the vehicle that was uh, the Subaru that was taken on Main Street, and in terms of the Riverside, that would probably be, I would estimate for sure it was gone for a couple of days, but it's uh, part locally, so it was probably not a local one. Okay. The other ones, I'm guessing not. Okay. Yeah, I just, uh, just uh, something that you know, we can just uh, caution people to make sure they lock their vehicles and so forth. So anyway, overall, thanks for the report once again. Uh, to you and your team, you do an amazing job and uh, thanks for getting us through the Christmas holidays and uh, 
And uh, of course, I know that um, you do great work when it comes to the highways. So kudos on the group. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Maria. Moving on, next. Good to meet you, Sean. Thanks. Uh, just a comment. Uh, I noticed that the district of Sycamus has got no camera. We got no camera. Can you see that someone else? The <clears throat> camera's pointed at the bottom, isn't it? There you go. I don't care. But... <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, oh, I thought it was someone. EOS uh, strategic priorities. Uh, counselors, uh, counselors online, counselors at the table. Uh, do you want to comment on anything on the strategic priorities at this stage? Council Bushel, go ahead. I think I think we're going to have a manager's report. Uh, Daryl's going to give us a. I was wondering about the pump track and uh, and the Owlhead Bike Park, but I think you'll probably bring that up in in uh, in the manager's report. Uh, that'd be scheduled for the next meeting. Would be the capital report. I I can speak to the Owlhead one if I know you wanted to get a bit of a, a briefing on that. Okay. Well, we will we'll wait till you get your operations report. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Same with Brett and I got uh, Brett. I had one for Brett on the on the fire mitigation too. Okay. Thank you uh, to the chair. Um, so as far as uh, fuel mitigation work, uh, we've had a number of grants that uh, are approaching the end of, of their cycles. Um, we had a 2019 uh, CRI grant, so that's a community resilience infrastructure grant. Uh, that's pretty well completed. Uh, 2020 is for the most part uh, completed as well, and uh, we have 2021 grants that are near completion. Uh, that one included the lower part of the uh, owl head and uh, quite a dense bit of brush. Uh, a lot of material came off of that, and it, it did impact the, the budget for that work. Um, but I had a good conversation with the contractor, and uh, they do intend as part of that same grant to continue on with the work that uh, was directed for uh, up on Bayview Estates and uh, kind of behind the dump area that uh, Gordon and I discussed. Uh, so that is, uh, will be continuing on in the uh, spring. And uh, they feel that it might be a little less of the chipping work that they did like on, on Owlhead uh, and a little more burning just because of the, uh, the lesser, uh, lesser amount of grant available. The uh, FES grant, which was, uh, close to a million dollars is approaching its end of phase as well. Uh, in the spring, we'll be expecting some minor burning, uh, a bit more hand cleanup up from the machine work that was done up on the hillside. And if you're kind of back in the, uh, uh, away from it a little bit, you can see where they created these, these bands of uh, protective area around the community on that side of the town. And uh, it was a challenge this year in the fire, thank goodness, but uh, it was already there. With, uh, would have been able to slow things down a little bit had we had a wildfire start coming into town from that direction. So that, that work is still in place and uh, it's finishing up. It'll be probably a phase in the spring and then potentially another one in the fall. Um, and hopefully we'll have be able to communicate out when they're going to be doing the burns and stuff to let the public know that this is not wildfire. It's it's just uh, us cleaning up some work that's been done. I'm very supportive of uh, the uh, clearing and the work that has been going on there. Uh, once they understand that that's the intent of it, uh, they're quite supportive of it. All right, comments uh, for Brett. Go ahead, Gordon. Yeah, Brett, um, yeah, it's looking really good over, you know, it's looking really good and they'll still continue to come this way. Um, I can't remember in the, in the beginning, do we have any thoughts about uh, over uh, on the Quay side and the Old Town Bay side? You know, I know it's a lot steeper, and but as you maybe move towards Gamby Salt Squad, it's not too bad. Yeah, I think the area that was the greatest concern was uh, the area below the winery that was up there. And uh, the, the homeowner did a whole pile of work up there. If you, if, when, when we were looking at it originally, it was kind of a little bit that's a big concern, but uh, he got very concerned about it himself and decided to do the mitigation work himself. And it's, it's quite impressive the amount of work that he's done there. Uh, so that's really dealt with a large part of that area. Uh, some of the private lands have been had work done on them, um, but I think the challenge is, is it's extremely steep with the cliff uh, above it. And uh, talking to the contractors, they said, yeah, but the cost to do that work is gonna be 
prohibitive. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I think if people are doing their own work around their own properties. That's going to help quite a bit. Uh, in two mile or in that twin anchors area, there they've already done that work just from there. Their lots and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Brent. Next, sorry, uh, next focus will be uh, as far as rounds and grass. We didn't do anything for 2022. We wanted to finish up some of the stuff that we're working on, but uh, I think the next focus will be on the west side of town, and uh, we've got some areas plotted out there as well that uh, we've identified. So, I'm going. Okay, thanks, Brett. Any other comments or questions for Brett? All right, thanks, Brett. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. All right, anything else on? Teacher priorities. Okay, I'm hearing none, so we'll just move on. Um, so um, we have counselors' reports. Councillor Anderson, you're up. Thank you. Um... There's there's quite a bit going on. We had a uh, ECDEB brainstorming session last week, and uh, there was a group of us that got together, uh, council and staff, and we shared some uh, really good ideas out of that. So we can start to work uh, more on our ECDEB plan and um, what's going to you know bring businesses into Sycamus and um, how to attract them and keep our uh, community moving forward. So that was very informative. Um, the Shushwap, uh, Kelowna. Shushwap and Kelowna listed in the top 100 most loved travel destinations around the world by a tourism uh, sentiment in a tourism sentiment report. So that's pretty exciting. And uh, having said that, every business in town should probably capitalize on that uh, as we are the gateway to the Shushwap and the gateway to the Okanagan, um, Kelowna. So uh, that's kudos for us. And we can, uh, we can work with that to... Um, um, get out in front of the pack and get more exposure. Uh, tomorrow is a caribou recovery meeting, uh, backcountry and herd count. So that should be interesting. We haven't got together on that for a while. And um, the Shushwap Watershed Council still looking for community members at large to volunteer to sit on that board if anyone knows anyone or is interested. And I am still... Uh, being very busy advocating for uh, more money for aquatic invasive species. We need to keep this top of mind. You know, when you talk about it, everybody goes, oh no, well, it's been COVID. So it's kind of slowed down a bit and boat traffic hasn't slowed down a bit. So um, education is key and uh, everybody should have the uh, don't move, move a muscle, clean, drain and dry on their website, sitting stationary. So they never disappear off the website. So those curious clickers, whenever they go to your website, because this doesn't just affect pe people that own marina businesses or on the channel, it affects the economy. It will affect the economy. It'll affect everyone in, in um, Sycamus, anyone around the lake. So it's gonna, it will affect tourism. So it's, it's, um, it would be a really good idea if we could encourage everyone to put the clean drain and dry uh, logo on their websites. And that's it for me, thanks. Thanks, Colleen. Uh, Councilor McCabe, you're next. Thank you. Yeah, not much report. Uh, attended an interagency meeting last week. Um, things are going pretty smooth there, no red flags really. Uh, a few eight different agencies did their reports, but nothing too serious there. Um, uh, yesterday I attended uh, a labor force roundtable that was sponsored by our dev corp and the salmon arm dev corp and uh, community futures i believe that was interesting to see how um how closely um our housing market is tied to um uh the labor force they're they're interconnected so uh, it was from nine till noon and uh, most of the conversation was around uh, around housing for um seasonal laborers and and year-round young families and 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 how they support uh, the service industry and, and tourism business or or lack of it because of uh, housing so uh there were some interesting stats there um some stats that uh, didn't even show up in our um uh, housing needs assessment but uh, yeah and uh 
that's about it. I worked a little bit with Ammon on uh, Canada Mortgage and Housing uh, Corporation to uh, respond to, uh, present to council to ex respond to their housing accelerator ideas. And so council supported that uh, earlier today. So that's great. That's about it for my report. All right, thank you. Councilor Bushel. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I've uh, attended a trail connectivity meeting with uh, our, our planning department. Um, Jeff and I went through the maps and uh, we've actually uh, get them out to the rest of the councillor and the rest of the staff. And we're looking at uh, an active transfer police transportation plan and parks and trails master plan. So that was pretty interesting. Um, I attended the rec center budget meeting with uh, staff, Kelly, Evan and Jason was there and uh, Jeff and myself. And uh, the mayor, that was very interesting. Uh, we have some concerns about uh, the budget cost for the rec center. So we're working on that with them. Um, also attended a uh, Zoom meeting for the Thompson, uh, the Fraser Basin hosted a me meeting for the Thompson Fraser Flood Advisory Committee. So uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting. They meet, uh, they try to meet a couple times a year and uh, they have some big concerns about some of the areas in, uh, in our area, like the Eagle River and the, and the Shushwap River and some of our uh, small creeks that come into our area. But it was, uh, it was, a, it was a, a meeting with the whole Thompson area. So it was uh, quite a, there's about 30 people online and it was uh, very informative. And um, also just uh, had our planning meeting this morning. It was great working, uh, working with some of the developers and uh, uh, proponents that were putting forth uh, applications and working with staff to try to, to uh, get those pushed through and uh, make sure make sure that we keep uh, keep uh, the ball rolling. So, I uh, I really thought that that meeting went well today. Uh, planning meeting. Yep. Jeff did a good job sharing it. All right. Thanks, Gord. Councilor Aries. Oh, thank you uh, to the chair. Um, attended a uh, community economic development. Uh, uh, chat with a uh, consultant um, hired by the DOSDC and a few other councillors um, were at as well and had some interesting conversations about the strengths and weaknesses of, of opening a business in Sycamus as we see it. Uh, that's about it. A lot of projects going on to kind of keep on top of, but um, this uh, month was a little bit, a little bit shy on meetings. Councillor Malmas. Well, Gord, and I did exactly the same thing as him, so <laughs> I don't need to repeat it. He did such a great job with that report that I don't want to. I don't want to muck it up. <laughs> Good work, thanks, Councillor Evans. Thanks. Yes, a um, couple couple things to report. Just uh, talking to the principal at our high school, and uh, numbers have been affected quite a bit this month with uh, COVID cases and. Uh, um, teachers and students uh, catching presumably the home prone and uh, but uh, bouncing back pretty good from that. Um, I also got to go to the community economic development plan strategic session and uh, was very encouraged and learned a lot about business and developing it and uh, our town and I uh, thank Carly for working hard to help our active and um, also been aware this month, um, talking to different folks in town, and um, it seems that with the pandemic and with the normal January blues, it's an important thing to keep track of how your mental health is doing, because a lot of folks are struggling right now, and this month especially, and uh, this is the hardest month of the year, <laughs> and the last two weeks are proven to be the hardest time of the year, um, starting with Blue Monday, so... You know, if you're down, make sure you go and have a talk with a friend and uh, there's there's counseling at the resource center and other free um, options for you too. So keep keep it keep track of yourself. Talking to a couple of people today that are having a hard time. Bob. All right. Uh, so I've got quite a list here. So uh, as you might have heard earlier, uh, we met with AIM in regards to the uh, road conditions and uh, the accident um, and um, and there is a write-up in the Eagle Valley News as to the concerns that council has in regards to uh, uh, road maintenance and, of course, um, driving speeds. And uh, and so we did write a letter uh, to AIM and uh, to the uh, BC Trucking Association. 
Um, I met with uh, Doug Thomas, Chief of Spalatin. We talked about several different things and the different projects that we're working on. And one major project when it comes to the wellness uh, medical clinic at the end of Main Street. And he's really looking forward to moving forward with us on that. Several different budget meetings that I've attended, uh, North Okanagan Regional District uh, uh, Hospital Board uh, budget um, discussions and uh, I think we pretty much got that ratified. There'll be another meeting somewhere in March based on what their recommendations are when it comes to uh, improving um, medical health facilities in the region. Uh, also uh, in budget conversations right now with the CSRD. Um, there's also budget conversations with uh, the Economic Trust of the Southern Interior. Um, and uh, we've sat down with different uh, different communities and what they call or regional uh, area reps uh, when it comes to um, taking care of uh, the grant funding uh, adjudication and uh, we're putting together terms of reference. Um, I also attended the economic development meeting in regards to where we're going with that. Um, uh, attended a housing meeting uh, with um, Parkview Rep and uh, Habitat, and uh, and the possibility of of a, an additional housing program happening uh, when it comes to attainable housing in in uh, in Sycamus. Um, uh, COVID uh, issues regarding the mayor's. Uh, uh, round table um, and uh, interior health and uh, and all the different uh, uh, recommendations that are going forward now with Amicron and uh, the concerns that they all have. Um, and I know that's almost changing daily. And uh, and I attended a really interesting meeting the other day with the Shushwap Social Services and and uh, all these people that are on the ground that uh, that are uh, doing work on various uh, different uh, uh, social service groups. And, uh, and one really interesting conversation that came out of that was uh, emergency planning from Tom Hansen and the concerns that he has around uh, uh, the wildfire as we listened to Brett a little bit earlier today, but uh, they've got geotech people on that. And so uh, um, I think that uh, uh, we will be well informed when it comes to the spring runoff. Anyway, that's my report. Uh, probably more in there, but that's all I can think of right now. <clears throat> all right, so now to move on to the next thing, recommendation at the Committee of the Whole Now Rise and Report. I need a mover on that. Councillor Aries, Councillor Evans, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. And uh, we now have... Uh, input from the public, 15 minutes. So we've got allotted for this. Uh, uh, Jen's got her computer lined up here. And uh, if you wish to comment or speak, I know there's quite a few people online today. Um, thanking you for joining us today. Jen, have we got any hands up? Uh, we do, uh, Deb Heap has her hand up. Oh no. Yes. Deb Heap got her hand up. Oh, that's surprising. All right, Deb. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Your comment, please. Okay, so, sorry, I won't take long, but I just wanted to let you guys know that I'm going to send an email out in the next week with my tentative plans for communities and blooms for uh, DOS consideration. But the important thing I wanted to communicate tonight is that uh, based on what Daryl had told me, he wanted us to go as late as possible for the judging, but early in the week. And so I have got communities in bloom to tentatively, well, actually, they, they say they're pretty firm to uh, for July 19th for the judging. So they would arrive on the 18th in the afternoon, judging that evening and the 19th and then departing on July 20th. And that way the plants will look a little bit better because it's a little bit later in the season. Um, the other thing is, is I've confirmed rooms for that. And that, so if you guys have any issues with those dates, 
um, I need to know right away because as you can imagine, in the middle of July, it's really hard to get rooms in Sycamus. Plus, once we've got our schedule set with Communities in Bloom, they open up these spots to the other communities for the rest of it. So um, just wanted to get that out there and I will get you guys a, an email with my plan shortly. Thank you. Deb, you're doing such a good job that we signed you up for another 10 years. Are you okay with that? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. All right, anybody else online? I don't see any other hands this time. If anyone wants to address council, please raise your hand. All right, so we can move on. No other hands up. Okay, no other hands. thanks. All right, so moving on to the next thing, staff reports, Monashi Music Festival. And uh, could Jason, could you just, uh, for the benefit, we did talk about this earlier, but uh, for the benefit of the gallery and the people online, give us a report, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, this is just a report back to council um, from a presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, that was made by the Monashi Music Festival on November 24th. So they had some funding requests uh, of council and council asked that uh, staff go away and look at the requests and come back with what we could provide for them. Um, and so this just gives you the de details of, of the request and, uh, and what they're looking for. Um, at the core of this, there were two items that they asked for on their list that were not in control of, uh, of the District of Sycamus, and one of those was RCMP funding. And the second was camping at the school grounds that we've redirected them to the proper um, the sources for information there to go get that information. Um, they, also, they also made um, requests of pieces of equipment uh, for us, which uh, was this, <clears throat> the stage, the wash car, a couple of tents and some fencing. Uh, the fencing will not be available um, at the time of the festival. It'll be in other locations and being used or that we won't be able to provide that. The stage, the wash car, and the tents are all available. Um, for those three pieces, uh, I also gave a financial breakdown of the cost for the, for the district to provide that um, to them uh, beyond the actual rental co co costs that would be waived. Then there, there is staff time to set them up, to clean, clean them up, to prepare them, those type of things. And so th that cost is listed in the financial implications. And for those three items, it's approximately $11,000 to provide those. And then there's the, the last uh, request that they made was for uh, $12,000 for marketing and promotion. And of course, that's the discretion of council if they want to provide the, those, those funds or not. So um, they, the recommendation is for, for council to, to uh, make a decision on, on which those, the, the, um, sorry, provide direction to staff on what we should follow through with. Okay. All right. Comments or questions for Jason? All right, got that looked after at this date. All right, so uh, what's next on staff reports, housing needs report, um, we have somebody online, Ada, I believe. What? Scott will introduce. Now I'm Scott? Yeah, we can ask Scott to introduce Jada. Hi, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so we have Jada Bassey from City Spaces um, prepared to, to present the housing needs report um, through Zoom here. Um, yeah, Jada was hired by, uh, by us to uh, come up with this housing needs report. Um, and then there is a recommendation um, from staff to council to, uh, to post this on the, uh, the, the website. Um, that's a requirement through the, the um, community charter, I believe or the, the local government act that have to check the resolution be sure but um, yeah also i'll uh, i'll turn it over to, to jada who's uh, going to present us on the some of the research she did and some of the outcomes of the, the housing needs report right thanks Scott. we do have a resolution here uh so i'm just gonna get a mover and a seconder on this so Recommendation that council received the housing needs report as presented this 26th day of January, 2022, pursuant to section 585.31 of the Local Government Act and direct staff to publish the report on the District of Sycamus website in accordance with part 585.4 of the Local Government Act. I need a mover on this, Councillor Malma, second by Councillor Aries. Any comments or questions on this at this stage? All right, I'm going to call a question. Oh, 
Did you want the presentation on the report? Is she on here? She is, yes. Okay, sorry. Jada, you got the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council and Scott for the introduction. I will share my screen and it is a brief uh, presentation, I, I promise. Okay, so I am pleased to present to you the findings from the housing needs report for the District of Sycamus. I do want to say that <clears throat> I have a special thank you for district staff who were very supportive and responsive to our team throughout this process. So thank you very much for that. So what I'm going to do is just recap the process, share with you um, the sickness housing situation and some of the key indicators and evidence um, of that situation, share with you some considerations for um, how to address the housing needs and gaps, talk about next steps and answer any questions that you may have. So a recap. Uh, the purpose of the housing needs report is to identify populations most challenged to afford housing in a local market, identify housing gaps and any other housing issues. So by populations, we're looking at different types of households, seniors, uh, families, low-income households, uh, seasonal workers, for example. Housing gaps, we look at tenure, so that's rental and home ownership. We also look at, uh, at typology, so things like single detached apartments, townhouses, and that kind of thing, and any other housing issues that we feel are interrelated um, to these challenges. We look broadly across the entire housing continuum. So um, this isn't just affordable housing. We're looking at market rental, a home ownership, really the full spectrum. The, this is really an ecosystem. And if there's any challenges in one area of the continuum, it often adds pressures or pinch points uh, to the other. So we do look quite broadly um, across the continuum to identify housing gaps. Our process was fa fairly straightforward. We had research, we looked at data and indicators that were outlined by the province, the, the legislative requirements that the district uh, needed to fulfill. So we collected um, uh, quite a bit of data, put it in graphs, it's, it's in the report. We also added some supplemental data that we thought would be useful um, for the Sikkimus context. We had an engagement process which included an online survey, some virtual workshop with stakeholders, as well as one-on-one -on -one interviews with some key stakeholders. And then we produce the final housing needs report that summarizes the statement of need, all the evidence um, uh, that the legislation requires, um, and also a summary of the survey results, um, data, and what we heard from, from engagement. Okay, so the Sycamus housing situation. I, I think this is no surprise. I did overhear some of the uh, conversations earlier with council about things like uh, seasonal workers um, and uh, and in businesses uh, trying to recruit retain workers. That is exactly what we heard and what we found in, in our process as well. So some of the key themes include an aging population, a lack of diverse housing forms, limited availability of long term purpose built rental housing that's also secured. Um, and again, yeah, housing issues such as a lack of diverse housing and rental housing leading to staffing shortages. And we're also seeing an emerging pattern of inadequate housing. So housing that uh, doesn't have enough bedrooms to accommodate um, a number of roommates or in, in poor condition or starting to deteriorate in some, in some degree. So these are just some of the indicators that you'll find in the report. This is uh, looking at the age demographics. On the left are the zero to 14 year olds. And as you move to the right, the age cohorts uh, get a bit older. And you can see in Sycamus uh, to the right that we have a fairly aging population, including the age groups of 50 to 54, 55 to 59. I know that's not old yet, but you know every year we all get a bit older. Those age cohorts will um, end up moving into more senior populations. And this is really where um, one of the pressures and challenges are is to find that accessible, seniors oriented housing in Sycamus. Uh, this graph shows us the, uh, um, the housing forms in terms of typology. 67% of homes in, in Sycamus are single detached. And then we have 11% movable or mobile, 10% townhouses and 6% that are uh, apartments fewer than five stories. So when we think about populations in need of housing, such as seniors, a lot of them are living in single detached homes and uh, they may be overhoused or, or empty nesters looking to downsize. And right now there's not a lot of options for them if they wanted to move out of those single detached homes. 
And this is also true for newcomers coming to Sycamus who are looking for um, a place to rent. Um, often you won't find that in a single detached home and, and there are few options for them at this time. Similar with the bedroom mix, this pie graph shows that there's an even distribution between two, three, and four bedroom units, but 9% of the housing units in Sycamus are one bedroom units. And um, we do think that there is a need for more of those one bedroom units to accommodate uh, singles and couples moving to, to the community, as well as some seniors looking to downsize um, into a smaller unit. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight again the seasonal um, employee and workforce uh, situation. Uh, we did hear a lot about employees declining positions because of the lack of housing um, that's affordable and available to them. And here's one quote from the survey that's fairly representative of what we heard. Um, this, this respondent said, there is nowhere for, to rent for locals and folks looking to work here for the summer. So in summary of priority groups, uh, we identify seniors, and that's a, quite a range in itself, low income seniors, seniors looking to downsize, uh, seniors who are mobile and active, seniors who have mobility issues. Um, so there, there's quite a few um, uh, types of seniors in that category, young adults, low income families, low income households, as well as se seasonal workers. Uh, and in terms of housing gaps, uh, affordable housing units is, are needed, rental housing, seniors-oriented housing, and family-oriented housing. So as part of our process, we looked at some uh, maybe low-hanging fruit or, or some ideas that the district may want to consider exploring if you're going to do a strategy or an action plan. I'm going to talk about these very briefly, but if you'd like me to dive into additional detail, I'm, I'm happy to do so. So the first um, uh, set of uh, considerations are under partnerships. So um, we supported establishing a housing committee to keep the momentum going, uh, to, to look to implementing um, some of the, the, um, uh, the key considerations that we're outlining here, maybe even developing a strategy. Looking for collaboration and stacking funding, Right now, the environment at senior levels of government, there's a lot of investment in, in rental housing and affordable housing. So it's an opportunity um, uh, to really uh, stack that funding to make projects work. I also suggest looking at ways to scale up the local building and development community. A lot of the local builders are familiar with the single detached home form, but we're looking to um, deliver more multi-unit housing like townhouses, apartments, and, and it may require education, skill building, capacity building. So that is an area uh, possibly to consider looking into. On strategic in initiatives, promoting ex existing housing assistance programs like the rental assistance program would be a good idea. Utilizing municipal owned land for affordable housing. Um, sometimes, you know, CMHC, BC housing, they're really looking for local governments to contribute things like land in order to make the uh, investment in affordable housing more attractive for your community. So uh, definitely something to consider. And then other financial incentives to make projects um, work. And then finally, uh, on the growth management side, potentially looking at ex expediting affordable housing applications. So allowing them to jump the queue uh, and, and to move those forwards and prioritize. I also suggest monitoring unit absorption. Um, there was some population decline in, in previous census. So we just wanna be cautious not to unintentionally overbuild um, the supply. So as new units are being um, delivered to the market, just paying attention to occupancy and vacancy rates, um, because we don't want to get in a situation where we get um, high vacancy, for example. So that striking a balance between ensuring units are available uh, to accommodate everyone, but not overbuilding. And then lastly, uh, maybe considering adding elements to the plan checklist. Um, for example, when development applications are presented to the municipality to review those through the lens of the priority groups and groups as well as the housing gaps in mind and, and maybe giving some feedback to those um, uh, uh, applicant, applicants in terms of how to maybe tweak their concepts to meet the needs of, um, of uh, the housing needs in the community. So finally, next steps, we prepared a summary form to be submitted to UBCM. So this outlines um, all the requirements that the district has fulfilled and, and summarizes the outcome of the process and the findings. And then we just suggest that you utilize the findings from the housing needs report to inform uh, subsequent planning processes. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. 
Right, thanks, Jada. Online, Malcolm, Colleen, do you have questions, concerns? Go ahead. Yeah, if I could, if hey. I could step in. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, and thank you very much for the housing needs assessment. Um, yeah, I guess it's broke down in two parts: uh, quantitative and and qualitative. In the in the in the qualitative part, you know, the the surveys and the public engagement and uh, and and all that uh, that our staff did and and yourself did. Um, I think that part's good, but the quantitative part. Uh, seems to be lacking. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm sound rude here. Um, uh, taken from a 2016 uh, Stats Canada, and uh, throughout the report, I noticed you, you weren't able to get anything from Canada Mortgage and Housing or BC Housing that could be isolated down to Sycamus because it's we're melded in with Salmon Arm or the region. So, as far as uh, quantitative data goes, we're five or six years old. And this report is just now, we're gonna vote on it to put it on our website that this is the document that we're gonna use for planning and our OCP, for, for adopting new bylaws, for uh, allowing any variance permits or, or, or development permits. Um, this document has not captured, and it says right in a document that it has, this all this data is pre-COVID, so it doesn't capture anything in the last two years during COVID. And I think there's a huge quantum shift in, uh, in, in housing in, in across Canada because of COVID. And it relates to uh, urban millenniums uh, realizing that they can work in a rural setting. And so you see this shift from urban to rural, which is not captured in this report at all, quantitatively. Um, Sure, you use stats from 2016 Stats Canada, and then you make assumption on those stats, and then you use those assumptions to forecast trends. But I think this is a unique case in history where you, you can't forecast five years ahead because, because of what happened in the last two years with COVID. So I, I strongly suggest the staff that um, when I think the next uh, Statistics Canada is coming out um, is was is complete in 2021, but the federal government has to um, digest that information before it's released. I don't know if it's released yet. I don't think so, but I'm not sure. I I strongly suggest that we immediately revise this document to reflect at least the 2021 stats, and that the the council uh, staff take proactive reports to start working with them. BC housing and Canada mortgaging housing that the housing statistics are isolated to our community and we become a community recognized and not just grouped in with Sam and Arm or the region. So I, 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 I'm, I'm not happy with the report. I mean, our, our staff did a great job there with all the, uh, with all the qualitative stuff and, and yourself, you know, for public engagement and surveys. Um, but with the quantitative, uh, I think it's a useless document, to be frank. Sorry. Uh, may I may I respond? Yeah, Councillor, I don't I don't disagree with you on the limitations to the to the quantitative. Um, this is a, a a common challenge that small and rural communities across BC and Canada um, experience, and it and it's really makes it difficult for um, uh, good analysis or deep analysis um, and to be able to make decisions. So um, you are right, Stats Canada will be releasing data this year. Um, the, the first uh, release is gonna be in, in February and they're gonna have um, uh, incremental releases as well with, with that data. And yeah, I don't know what to say about CMHC and BC Housing. On BC Housing, what happens is, is if they have a very low number of applicants on the wait list or, or who are registered, they need to suppress the data for privacy reasons. And so that was um, the response that we got from BC Housing as well. So when there's a really low number, they suppress it and then um, we don't have much to report. But yes, there is um, quite a, a extensive limitations to the data available for SICMOOS and other small and rural communities. Thank you. Okay. Uh Councillor Evans and then Councillor Malmos, go ahead. Thank you, through the chair. Uh, thank you, Janice, for your good work. I'm wondering um, 
Are you going to be meeting with the uh, housing committee that's being established soon? Well, my uh, my role um, uh, is is complete after this council presentation. So um, I would maybe redirect that to Sarah or Scott about how they're going to engage with the with the committee. Thank you, Councilor Malmes. <clears throat> yes, good good report. Uh, yes, it might be the information might be outdated, but you work with what you had available to you. So that's that's all you can do with that. I have just a couple of questions, like. Uh, in your graph, you showed 9% one bedroom. Did that 9% one bedroom, did it give an average square footage of that one bedroom unit? No, it does not. Okay, and then my next question was, is that uh, it seems that you mentioned that and it's in your photo there where you talk about housing needs and the housing, that it's mostly townhouse, it's not single detached housing, correct? Is that the preferred? Um, the preferred stock? Yeah, well, mainly ground-oriented multi-units. So right now what we have um, is single detached um, homes, and we also have some, uh, some apartments and mobile homes. But when we heard from the community what would be um, a, a preferred housing stock is something ground-oriented, be it a townhouse, a duplex, or a triplex. They're quite versatile. Um, they, can, they can work well for families. They can work well um, for, for roommates as well. Um, and they might be uh, scalable, right? So sometimes if we're um, trying to get more multi-unit housing, apartments might be a, a scale. Sometimes that can be a bit challenging for the local builders and developers, or maybe even with the infrastructure, so water and sewer. Um, but the, that type of housing form can, can be more conducive to the local infrastructure capacity. All right, Councilor Bushel, go ahead. Yeah, through the chair, yeah, thanks very much, Jada. That's a, that's a nice report. Um, yeah, I kind of agree with Malcolm, but on another, you know, we've, we've, uh, we're have we going to be paying for the document and uh, and I don't know if we could, you know, put it on the website with caution and maybe uh, in two, maybe a month or two when the, the stats are coming out, we can, we can re retweak it and then send it to UBCM. I'm not sure how that works, but. That's just my thought. It's not that, you know, it doesn't take that much to tweak this document, I don't think. All right. Colleen. Colleen, yeah, go ahead, Colleen. Thank you. I just want to uh, thank you, uh, um, Jada. I just want to make a comment on the, uh, there was a comment on there about seasonal housing and bringing seasonal folks in for looking for places to stay. It's totally a different market. Um, those folks are making maybe, you know, minimum wage is 15. So they're making 16, $17 an hour and they're here for a very short term. So it is, it, it does complicate a housing market survey because that is totally a different, it's a different program that you're looking at. There's people that are coming to Sycamore for actual housing or changing their homes. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, Colleen. All right, any other comments or questions for Jada? Councillor, Councillor McCabe, you're up. Yeah, thank you through the chair. So one of the nuggets that we can get out of this, I think in looking on page 23 about the, the top three housing issues uh, from the online survey results. One was lack of long-term rental options due to the short-term rental market. Well, I think with our new bylaw that we're going to adopt shortly, that'll address some of those uh, short-term rental market issues. Uh, the second one, lack of housing for seasonal workers. That's that's a tough one like Councillor Anderson, Anderson just spoke to. But the third one, supply of accommodation for an aging demographic. Now, throughout the report, that one thing that I did notice in here was that um, in Sycamus, and I don't think it's unique to Sycamus, it's probably provincial and, and, and national, is that uh, seniors, when they're trying to downsize, they don't have a unit to downsize, which represents maybe that 9% that Councillor Malmas was talking about. And uh, they're in a single detached home and, and they're aging out, if you will, and, and downsizing and trying to age in place, but there's no, um, 
no units for them. And so they're sort of keeping hostage to single detached homes in Sycamus without creating new construction. So when we move forward with any housing projects, for that reason, and because of that graph that showed uh, we're heavy weighted in seniors, especially from 50 onwards, that we should focus a lot on uh, on seniors. Uh, you know, I mean, we have this this report has showed a housing gap right across the housing spectrum for Sycamus. But so where do we focus? I think if we focused on seniors being able to downsize, which frees up their single detached home for young families to move into, it's sort of a uh, uh, two birds with one stone kind of thing. Thanks, Malcolm. Any other comments? All right. Thanks, Jada. Anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, we do have a resolution on the floor and uh, that resolution has <clears throat> been put forward uh, to uh, Council to receive the housing needs report as presented. Uh, any other comments on the actual resolution? All right, I'm going to call a question on the resolution. All those in favor? Malcolm, Colleen. All right, good. Carried unanimously. Thank you. All right. And thanks, Jada. So moving on to the next thing, uh, we have um, the development permit application number 21-368 DP, 1721 Hillier Road uh, East. Um, I'm gonna have uh, Scott comment on this because I was uh, informed today that this was at the planning committee meeting and the recommendation that I have here laid out on the agenda was to be revised. So uh, Scott, do you have it there now? Uh, so would you like to comment on that, please? I do, and I can, thank you, Chair. Um, so this was a, an application uh, for development permit that the Planning and Development Committee uh, considered. And, um, they, their recommendation was to um, amend uh, the development permit and remove um, section or amend section 4C1 and that would to be remove oil and grit separator as a requirement. Um, and uh, so we had uh, Sarah and Jeremy and Daryl consider that this afternoon and they, they're okay with that. Um, that was the main thing was we wanted to make sure that uh, engineering was on board. So um, yeah, that's a, uh, you can add that to the, the recommendation, I guess, um, as a condition of the recommendation. Um, but uh, I can present the, 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 the permit in from beginning to end, and then you can make that change. Or if you want to make the change now, um, it's up to you. Uh, Councillor Malmas, you got your comment. Got a comment? Yes. Uh, no. Thank you, through the chair. No. Uh, I I think we should uh, go ahead with the recommendation. We reviewed it and discussed it extensively at the uh, Planning Development Committee, and that was uh, probably forty minutes of conversation. Uh, basically, you have a development that started ten years ago, and they have. 30 or 31 dry wells throughout the property. And it was, if they have to have it re-engineered, it means it's got to be all dug up and everything done where the, the oil spill is, I don't know if they have a drain of the floor where they're washing or working on vehicles such as what they do with the uh, sea dog. So that was clarified and the staff with clarification. And so that's why the, oil separator was removed from that part so okay all right so as the recommendation i have in front of me right here uh is uh, going to be adequate based on the uh planning committee you want me to read it you'll you 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 can endorse it so recommendation that the district of sick was authorized an issue development permit number 21-368 dp for strata 
EPS 313 and Lot 1, Section 6, Township 22, Range 7, west of the 6th Meridium Camelot Division, Yale District Plan, EPP 32799, except Phase 4, 2, 10, Strata Plan, EPS 313, 1721, Hillier Road East for the development of a strata storage facility. Moved by Councillor Malmas, seconded by Councillor Bushel. Any minor comments or questions on this? Okay, I'm gonna call the question. All those in favor? Malcolm, Colleen, good, thank you. Carried unanimously, thank you. All right. Going into bylaws and policies. Zoning amendment application number 21-145RZ806 TransCanada Highway. There's a recommendation that the District of Sycamore's zoning bylaw amendment number 1007-2022 be given first and second reading this 26th day of January 22, and that a public hearing to hear representation on District of Sycamore's bylaw number 1007-2022 be scheduled. I need a mover on this. Councillor Malmas, seconded by Councillor Bushel. Scott, would you give us a quick report on this, please? And thank you, Mayor. Um, so staff's recommending that this application receive first and second reading, um, <clears throat> and then a, a public hearing to be scheduled later. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the property. It's uh, where the Best Western is on the corner of uh, Highway 1 and Roma Road. Um, the applicant is um, looking to rezone it um, and then uh, construct a six story building with uh, some a residential component, uh, visitor accommodation and commercial use. Um, and then they're also proposing to provide 10 attainable dwelling units. Uh, development permit was considered by the planning and development committee and um, that'll be coming later. Um, here you can see the OCP uh, designation is highway commercial B. And that, uh, that designation allows mixed high density uh, residential uses. And here's the, the zoning bylaw. Um, so right now it's zone C2 high, highway tourist commercial. And the proposal is to create a new zone, which would be um, C2A highway commercial residential. This is similar. We have a, um, another zone uh, downtown that allows uh, you know, the, the typical commercial uses, but also allows a, a multifamily residential use. So this is similar to that. Here you can see the layout of the, uh, the proposal. So the, the blue building is, would be the new building. So there's the existing Best Western. Then you see this blue building. There's a, a shared access uh, fire lane between Tim Hortons and the Best Western. There's an access there. And then there's an access uh, off the highway. Um, so the, this proposal also includes a, a subdivision which would subdivide this new building from the, the existing motel and the existing Best Western. Here's what the, the building would look like. Um, so this is gonna be considered through the, the development permit area. Um, so you can see the, uh, the finishes. Um, one of the things we were looking for is you know, a breakup of that, uh, that massing of the building. So they've added some, some features there that should, should achieve that. And then the, the new zone. So the, the new zone is actually very similar to what is proposed in the, the new zoning bylaw number 1000. So this, uh, we're actually hoping that uh, we'd have that bylaw a little further along and we wouldn't have to do a one-off rezoning. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they did make the application in June. So we've had, definitely had it on radar. This is gonna be very close to that new um, highway tourist commercial zone. Um, and so then we're the big difference between C2 and C2A is the, the G you see there, which would add multifamily dwellings. And then, uh, and then also the height. So the height would be 24 meters or six stories. Um, we did uh, refer this out um, <clears throat> previously um, and we did get uh, positive responses back. Uh, Ministry of Transportation provided preliminary approval. Uh, engineering technologist, uh, uh, let us know that the road upgrades would be required at the, the subdivision stage. And the, the fire chief, um, he did have some questions re, re, regarding fire resistant materials, the building would need to be sprinkled and fire department equipment access. Um, 
and we are working on uh, getting answers to some of those questions. Um, so um, as we move forward, um, some of those questions are all being answered through the, the development permit as well. Um, so again, this, uh, yeah, it fits really well with uh, what the community is trying to do, um, provides a little bit of uh, attainable housing, and then uh, the OCP allows for that uh, high density residential use in this zone. So uh, staff's recommending that, yeah, we move forward with uh, first and second reading, um, delegate the public hearing, and then, uh, and then we can uh, bring this to the public and get some feedback. Great, thanks, Scott. Councillor Malmus, would you like to comment on this as it went to the planning committee? <laughs> Excuse me, yes, through the chair. Yeah, it came to the planning committee as well. It's been there three times now. It's a it's a good project. It just had to be clear about a couple of property lines. The only thing that came out of the planning committee again was the idea that there's a fire laid through that property against the property line. They actually own half the road that accesses Tim Hortons and that they and Tim Hortons will be able to maintain that marking on that roadway through fair as a fire lane. That was the only comment. All right, thank you. All right, uh, any other comments on this before I call a question? All right, I'm going to call a question. All those in favor? Call a question. Malcolm has a question. Oh, Malcolm yeah. does. Okay. Th thank you, Colleen. Thank you, Your Worship. Welcome. Yeah, I'm, I, I know Councilor Rollins, I, I was at the planning meeting this morning and you did an excellent job of chairing as, as usual. Um, parking, uh, Councilor Rollins, you're usually concerned about parking. I, I don't know, uh, a six story building with, I uh, forget how many units, is, is parking okay? It seems to be addressed or? Uh, through the chair, uh, yeah, staff went through this with them and uh, they've got a, a sufficient parking. That was why the one of the comments about the fire lane being maintained because they have, I can't read it from here, but the number seven parking spot has 12 or 14 parking spots in it. And their only way in and out of there is, is where that fire lane is being blocked by semis now. So that's why part of the reason that that fire lane parking had to be maintained so that they have access to parking on their building. So yes, they they have sufficient parking for all the units that they have there. Thank you. All right, any other comments? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll ask for the question again. All those in favor? Colleen, okay, carried unanimously. Thanks very much. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Malcolm. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Good night, job boy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, Council. Do you anticipation borrowing bylaw number 1014 2022? Uh, there's a recommendation that the revenue anticipation borrowing bylaw number 1014 22 be adopted this 26th day of January 2022. I need a mover on this. Councilor Aries, seconded by Councilor Bushel. Any comments on this? I think we we beat this up. Great, I'm gonna call a question on it. All those in favor? Carried unanimously, thank you. All right, we get into correspondence. Um, Malcolm, uh, Sikora A Pedestrian Safety website submission, Sikora A, would you like to comment on this? Sorry, just trying to get my mute button off there. Um, yes, I, I sent you an email earlier today and, and shared it with uh, Jen there too. So a while back, um, I, I don't normally go online, but I couldn't resist on that one because they're saying no one's going to do something until someone dies and they hate when people say that. Um, so yeah, um, it was discussed this morning at the planning uh, committee meeting about our uh, active transportation and uh, it was decided to share the, the draft of active transportation plan around Sycamus with the, the rest of council. So I'm sure we'll be getting that shortly. So my, the, the, the core, what's at issue here is um, when you cross Trans Canada Highway with the pedestrian active, activated uh, light, pedestrian activated light that stops the traffic and there's a crosswalk, 
but you get to the north side of the Trans Canada and you're you're nowhere. There's there's nothing. And between there and our our six million or five and a half or six million dollar bridge, which has got a, a beautiful pathway on it, um, it, it leads to nowhere. So we need to connect the bridge pathway to the pedestrian activated crossway pathway. And I'm hoping council agrees with me that as we, I, I was told this morning that that active transportation plan might not be finished until next December. Well, I was kind of hoping that we can get at least one nugget out of there to identify this as a priority and then, and then use that for information to apply for funding to maybe even get that built this year. So I have responded online to this, but uh, I think uh, this person has just sent it on to a mayor and council to make sure that it's not lost in bureaucracy. Scott from the line has a hand up. Yes. Okay. Scott. We have a hand up on line. It's Scott, the development service. Scott, Scott, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, just to respond to Councillor McKayev, um, and maybe add to a bit of what he said. So one of the things that came out as a priority in the active transportation network plan um, was like safe highway crossings. Um, so that's definitely something we're gonna be looking at. There's gonna be plenty of time for the public to participate. Um, and as Councillor McKayev said, we have a kind of a map that we created with all our, our wish lists on it. And uh, we're gonna provide that to council as well. So um, council can add to it and then uh, Hopefully when Urban Systems gets working on the plan, then they'll have a good idea of what uh, the priorities are. But uh, yeah, it's definitely something that, uh, that we, we can work towards through that active transportation network plan. And, and you know, the, the plan probably isn't gonna be ready until, uh, until December, but you know, some of the projects that come out of the plan, we might be able to have enough information to apply for grants and things. So um, yeah, we can definitely create some priorities and hopefully look for uh, some solutions. Councilor Bush will go ahead. Yeah, through the chair. This is one of those, uh, I mean, I, I know it's, it might, might not be, uh, it might not be uh, a, like a city approved uh, sidewalk, but this is one of those areas, it's not very far to go from the traffic, from the traffic light to Canby Salsqua Road. And uh, I know even if you went the other way along, along, the, along the river and got into the trees and then came out by the houseboat, you could actually, with public works, you could actually do just something temporary until highways does decide to widen the highway. And uh, we've done it even on, you know, Highway 97, we put that trail through the, you know, that was all put through the trees there. And we've even added a couple or extended a few little areas just ourselves with, with some, with some crush, uh, uh, rock and and uh, made it made it workable and it's now they're all you know good trails so I think we could probably do something fairly reasonable and uh, cost effectively just in the time being until highways decides what they're doing and uh, it wouldn't take long to line line it all up and get it done we do it on one of those work bees. Carol, you want to comment? Uh, through the chair, we'll uh, we recognize it. Staff recognizes that area as a high priority. Um, there are certain channels we have to go through to make sure we do it right. And so we'll look at it. We'll look at every option. So, uh, Councillor Malmos, go ahead. Yeah, I, what uh, Gord said is correct. I mean, the, the thing is, is I'd like to ask staff, we had a meeting with MOTI and MOTI said that they were gonna get back to us with a highway access corridor management plan of what they were gonna do up to that intersection where the Sycamore Cell Squad Bridge is. Uh, have we heard anything or is it just crickets on their side? Did we just have a meeting where they offered something and they're not gonna get, because I thought by now we would have heard something. They didn't seem to think it was that long. It was all part of the Silver Sands crossing. And yes, uh, I think that as far as the access goes, right now it would be difficult with the, with the bridge construction thing going there to have put anything in there as far as the crossing goes. I mean, but that, that work alone made it difficult, but uh, because it's kind of got flattened out now at the back side of the property, maybe we can talk to, I don't know if Steve still owns the, the business. 
I know he doesn't own the business, but does he own the building or did he sell the building in the business? And could we possibly just come off that bridge and put at the back end along the river behind the building an access over to that? Because you and I can do that in about three hours. You don't need district staff. All right. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. Thank you. Um, yeah, even just this week, I had a, another citizen approach me and express their concern about just being able to safely navigate that side of the highway as well. And and I've, I've had concern for months about the youth that leave the high school to go to Tim Hortons at 7-Eleven. And one day, five of them were playing Frogger with the trucks crossing the highway there. And, and uh, they, they ran in front of me while they were looking that way. And it's a good thing I was paying attention. It's a little scary. So it'd be nice if we could get on that. And I appreciate Daryl saying that it's on his list. I don't think we need a resolution on this. I think Daryl's kind of on this and you now heard from council their concerns. So yeah, I, I cross that bridge three or four times a day and I see the complications when people are coming across there, but it'll be good once that bridge is, uh, is built and there's lots of, lots of room when it comes to a walkway on the bridge. And that's what we do after the bridge on both sides of the bridge, not just this side. All right, Daryl, I think you're on it. We'll leave it with you. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for that, Malcolm. Uh, correspondence. Uh, and there's a, a list of correspondence here. Uh, does anybody wish to talk on any one of the issues that are on the correspondence at this particular stage? Councilor Anderson, go ahead. Thank you. Just a couple of things. The uh, Shushop Watershed Council, I just as I mentioned earlier today, is looking for volunteers to uh, community members at large to sit on the board. So if you're interested in uh, being part of that program, just um, um, send a, a quick email over and they'd appreciate that. And also uh, the other piece is the Chamber of Commerce newsletter. Um, they always do such a great job in keeping um, everyone informed and supporting local business in the community. So uh, just a shout out to them and sharing uh, programs that are available uh, um, for our businesses as well. So uh, just a big thank you to them. Thank you. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, just on the um, AIM Roads correspondence, um, it would be good if all of us could take time to do that survey and get it back to them. They have questions uh, like, do they effectively communicate, does AIM effectively communicate winter road driving conditions and just they want our input. Thank you for that, because I was going to comment on that as well. Uh, yeah, everybody online, if you could do that survey. One of the things that came out of the conversation with AIM when Greg Kylo and myself and Murray had the con uh, conversation with Gabe was the uh, area around communication and how they could maybe communicate more with uh, with people that are traveling the highway uh, that might be leaving Calgary and uh, not really recognizing what the road conditions are between say Revelstoke and Salmon Arm. So uh, they're hoping and uh, while they kind of said that they would do this that Sometime during the summer and fall, of, they were going to do a presentation uh, here at council chambers as well for the benefit of the community. Councilor Amalmas, go ahead. Yeah, to, to the chair to do with the A road thing. Uh, I, I think that, you know, it's AIM is the uh, company that the province hired to uh, do maintenance. Uh, and, you know, they do what they can given the conditions, like you couldn't do anything about that cold snap that hit because they didn't have a chance to get the ice out there and it doesn't work at minus 15 anyway. My brother-in-law worked for the predecessor of them and he was over for dinner and he explained that, you know, when it's 16 and 20 below, you put sand on the road and as fast as you dump it on the road, the semis go by at 100 kilometers an hour, he's blowing it all off the road. So there's no sand left there. So, you know, I don't know how you deal with that situation. But that stretch of road between Sycamuse and Sam Arm is probably in the top list of the worst sections of the Trans-Canada Highway. 
And that is incumbent our MOTI to, you know, when they're doing their four lane projects, they should be fixing the most dangerous spots. That road is bad because it sees sunshine. So it dries up, it looks good, and you step on it. The next thing you know, you come around the corner, you're in the rocks in the shade, and now you got ice. And so it gives you an uncertainty of what the road condition is. And it should be MOTI. It's got a great big sign just on the east middle of town here saying, you know, highway closed, highway this, slippery sections. They got nothing going that way. And it's actually worse to go from Sycamore to Salmon Arm than it is to go from, well, it's, it's just about as bad from Sycamore to the four lane because of the same conditions. The ability that the highway sees sunshine melts and then in the shade it freezes. So we can't blame AIM for bad road conditions, but MOTI is partly responsible. That's my personal opinion. And they've done nothing about it. They've, they've taken the easiest sections to make four lane out of, but the most dangerous sections include the Broom Bridge and the Turnoff. They, they've left them. They're, they're last on their list. Yeah, I agree with what you just said. And that conversation took place when we, when we had the conversation with AIM and, uh, and what would be priority when it comes to my concerns because of the 200 people that we have every day traveling between Salmon Arm and Sycamus and Sycamus and Salmon Arm. And uh, uh, our MLA, Greg Kylo, he, he, uh, he voiced his concerns around that as well, based on you know, how important it is to, to us to see whether or not that the next stage in four laning would be between uh, Sycamus and Salmon Arm. All right, uh, any more call? Colleen, go ahead. Thank you. Just to go uh, uh, comment more on the AIM situation. Um, weather's a factor, location's a factor, traffic's a factor. Um, training is a factor with AIM as well. Um, they're, they're newbies, they're, they're new team members. I think there should be a more rigorous, more in-depth training for their drivers as to uh, how and uh, and when they clear the roads. Um, I've seen some issues with just uh, not well cleared roads and it, it causes a bit of a, a mess as well. So it's a training issue as well. And it, it is in a lot of companies, but um, that's just something that uh, maybe you could, we could mention to them as well that they're, you know, what their staff knows exactly, exactly what to do in what conditions. I think Colleen. Yeah, that's that's true, Colleen. I agree. Um, I, I just, you know, I noticed I've been driving lots back towards Alberta and coming back, and I just noticed that I know uh, MCON, uh, MCON, yeah, MCON looks after Revelstoke area, not Ames, and they they run from the Eagle Pass parking lot. And I just happened to notice during that cold spell when the roads are really hard and icy and bumpy here. Uh, over there, they were fine. And uh, it's, I, I think they get to it quicker. I don't know if they're more prepared or they have more staff or whatever to get to it quicker. But I don't know what it's like going to Salmon Arm. Do you guys know this when you're going to Salmon Arm? Is it, you know, there, there's a halfway point for that too. I, I'm not sure who, I don't think Ames go all the way through Salmon Arm or maybe it's the same company, but it's a, it's a different uh, group of uh, uh, workers. So I don't know what it's like between Sycamore and Salmon Arm. Does it get better when you get to Salmon Arm? And I don't know. There's Something the, to think about. Yeah. So the road conditions from Calgary through to, say, Salmon Arm or Chase, there's multiple different components to the road conditions. First off, when you're going along, uh, when you're going along Shuswap Lake and you're getting uh, you know, wind blowing, you know, uh, water particles on the road, which has an impact on the road conditions and what's happening on top of Rogers Pass when you got 25 feet of snow, like, and so it's, it's complicated. It's not just straightforward. I know when we had that conversation with AIM, I learned a lot in about an hour and a half in that conversation as to what they're trying to accomplish, but they're also regulated by the province and that's what the, that's their challenge. One of the things that was brought up was 
was the sand that they put on the road now and and uh, the um, the type of sand and the size of the sand. So now it is almost like a powder based on the fact that it used to knock out too many windshields when they had larger particles. But in their conversation was that the larger the particles, the more it adheres to your tires and the more traction you get on the more it actually stays on the road. Councillor Malmus was right, you know, one truck goes by and next thing you know, all the sand's gone. So yeah, it's just not that simple. And I, I, I think though that AIM and my discussion with them, I know that every, there was four different guys there and they have a family that rides, drives on that road as well. And I really felt legitimately that they really do care. And they don't like the fact that some accident happened on that highway and the fact that fingers are being pointed at them, but um, they, they are challenged. And at the same time, I think that um, they realize that at times they got to pick it up a notch. Anyway, anything else on this? Okay, then uh, anything else on any of the other correspondence? All right, I'm hearing none. So what does that mean? It means that our meeting is coming to an end. Anyway, thanks for everybody that uh, viewed in and uh, came online and uh, Councillor McCabe and Councillor Anderson also online uh, for zooming into the community or to the uh, Council meeting tonight. It's a recommendation that the regular council meeting as of January 26, 22 be adjourned at uh, 634. Councillor Malmus, Councillor Aries, all in favor? We're out of here. Thank you. Hasta la vista, baby.